Good afternoon um, to the session, Promoting Human Rights to an International Data Agency. Um, welcome both to our participants and speakers here on site and also on to our online audience. I am Evelyn Tornitz. I'm going to be moderating the session today. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute of Social Ethics, University of Lucerne, Switzerland, and also a MAG member here of the UN INGF. Here today with me are Peter Kirschleger, director of the Institute of Social Ethics, also University of Lucerne, Switzerland, um, Kutoma Wakanuma, professor at the Montfort University in Zambia and UK. Then we have um, Frank Kirchner, professor at the German Research Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Germany. He's online. He'll be joining us online. We have here with us on site also Hyung Jo Kim, from professor at Chuang University in Korea. And then we have um, Migle Laukite, professor at Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, Spain. She will be joining us online. And then we also have Yuri Lima from the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He will also be joining online. Um, one, some words to the flow of this session. We will start with short input um, presentations. It's just really short to give you a bit of an overview of what the session is going to be about. Afterwards, it's going to be a question and answer. Um, from both online and um, on-site participants. And then we would really like to also have uh, like open the floor in the sense of having a lively discussion with, uh, with all of you. Also hear your inputs, your comments, what do you, and your contributions, um, which you would like to share with us. So let's start with, uh, with Peter, who is here with us today. So if you could maybe explain in the beginning um, what this um, international data agency, what it is about and how it will contribute to strengthen human rights. Well, thank you so much, Evelyn, and um, thank you to you all of you being here. Um, a warm welcome um, to this to this session. So um, the idea of the International Database Systems Agency, IDA, is a result of um, a multi-year project um, started at Yale University in the US and then finalized at the University of Lucerne, basically addressing the question how we can we make sure that we identify early enough the ethical opportunities and the ethical risks of so-called AI in order to make sure that all humans can benefit from the ethical opportunities and that we are able to master the risks in a way that humanity and the planet can flourish. And I, based on that research, uh, I made two concrete proposals. One is to deal with um, AI in a human rights-based way, so talking about human rights-based AI. This means, though, looking at the entire value chain um, of so-called AI. So looking into how we you know, extract the resources that this is happening in a human rights respectful way, how we produce technology products, also there that we do that in a human rights respecting way, and also then the use and also maybe human rights based the non-use of certain technologies if we um, you know, um, get to recognize that certain, techno certain technologies we shouldn't use because they may be you know, human rights violating. And that, was the f that is the first concrete proposal. And the second proposal is to think um, so-called AI uh, with a dual nature, so having ethical uh, upsides and ethical downsides, and comparing that to nuclear technologies. Because also there we have you know, ethical positive potential, but also ethical negative potential. And thinking in the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency, simplifying it, in the field of nuclear technologies, we were doing research, we built the atomic bomb, we used the bomb several times, and then we realized as humanity that we need to do something about it in order to avoid the worse. 
I'm fully aware that the International Atomic Energy Agency is not a perfect solution. It has its Im geopolitical implications. But still, I think it needs to be admitted that it was able to avoid the worse. So I think in analogy in the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency, we should also establish at the UN an International Database Systems Agency, IDA. Um, IDA aiming for fostering peace, promoting sustainability, and promoting human rights, but also making sure that no AI-based product, which is human rights violating, is ending up on the market. And I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and this session about this idea of IDA. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter, for providing us with this overview and um, what you're envisi envisaging for IDA. Uh, we go on now to Kutuma, who will also um, give us a short input on, um, on IDA and um, what possible role you would see. Hello. Oh, is it on? OK. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this uh, session, which I'm hoping you know we'll have a very uh, good discussion between us and uh, yourselves. Um, I think um, it is very important that uh, we do think about establishing an agency such as uh, IDA. And I think one of the things that we ought to be doing as we try to advocate or as we advocate for the establishment of IDA is to look at how we can be responsive uh, when it comes to the identification or the identified um, social and ethical uh, concerns around uh, uh, emerging technologies <coughs> like uh, artificial intelligence. Um, oftentimes, when these technologies are being uh, uh, innovated, they're being developed or perhaps designed and then implemented, one of the things that is, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that uh, is always uh, looked at is the positive aspect of these particular technologies. Very little, I think, in the process of these uh, designs up to the implementation stage, uh, do we, or, or do the developers think about the consequences or, or the threats that these technologies uh, present? And um, this then brings us to concerns uh, around uh, the privacy and uh, data protection, for example, and also other ethical concerns such as uh, ownership and control, because we know that um, as the technologies are being developed, the, the concentration of ownership and control is uh, in the hands of a few, especially as they trickle down to, say, for example, the Global South. Um, we have issues around transparency and accuracy, of the technologies, we have uh, concerns around autonomy, we have uh, concerns around power, uh, you know, which then speaks to aspects related to monopoly, to dependency, and to a certain extent to digital colonialism as we, as the technologies become mainstream. Um, so rather than becoming uh, reactive when the concerns uh, start the unintended consequences start showing up, we need to be a bit more proactive. And I think this is where IDA might actually come in. So some of the questions that we need to ask is how do we become responsive to responsible innovation? Um, for me, I think one of the things that we ought to be uh, looking at is uh, being inclusive, uh, particularly when we are looking at how these technologies permeate globally. Uh, yes, of course, they perhaps uh, start from um, more developed uh, countries and then trickle down to less developed uh, uh, countries. But uh, the issues perhaps may be uh, similar to a certain extent because obviously privacy and data protection concerns I think could be universal to a certain extent. Although, of course, the way these uh, uh, concerns um, may be looked at or uh, experience could be slightly different. Uh, we also need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, we need to understand how these technologies can have an impact on the different uh, 
subjects that start using these particular technologies. Uh, so how do we go about ensuring that we co-create, for example, or co-produce these particular technologies? Because for the most part, we have these technologies as global technologies. And um, when we're talking about global technologies, sometimes we should be concerned about who are the voices that are representing these particular technologies in a global manner. Uh, do we have everybody at the table when we're talking about uh, 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 ethical concerns that impact people? And uh, for the most part, I think there is a gap in terms of who is at the table, whose voices are being represented, whose social and ethical concerns uh, we're going to be talking about. And if we're going to have an agency like uh, IDA, that may actually help in terms of uh, overlooking or uh, supervising or indeed monitoring these particular concerns so that we can actually use these innovations, uh, we can actually use these uh, emerging technologies in a more responsible and not irresponsible uh, manner. So this is what I have to uh, contribute for now and then uh, hopefully I'm looking forward to uh, an exchange with uh, everyone else here. Thank you. Thank you, Kutuma, uh, for adding this aspect of responsiveness, which is, um, I think, a uh, really key word. It is not often mentioned, but um, I think, um, yes, you're right. I mean, if we want responsible innovation, uh, it should be responsive, inclusive, and proactive, as you mentioned. Thank you very much for adding these points. So, um, we will go on now with, um, with Frank Kirchner, who is joining us online. Frank, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear and see me? Yes, we do. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. My name is uh, Frank Kirchner. I'm the director of the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence, actually, and at the same time, the professor for robotics at the University of Bremen. Um, what I would like to take a point of view, of course, from the, you know, creating these robots, creating these systems that we actually call AI-based robots because they have to act and are already acting in, in real world environments in direct cooperation, for example, with people in production facilities, but also already in private households. <laughs> and I think what we're seeing now is just the beginning of it, <clears throat> because in many countries, because of the uh, demographic factor, we will have a, a very, very high need for more and more of this kind of automation. At the same time, these systems will be required to do even more complicated tasks that usually have been done or are still done today by human beings. So what that means is that we have to create systems, robotic systems acting in a real world environment, maybe in direct contact with human beings that will have to be able to perform really, you know, complicated, maybe for human beings, trivial tasks, you know, like packing something or cleaning your house and stuff. But for a robot, for a technical system, it's still very complicated. And this can only be achieved with massive intervention by artificial intelligence tools. So having said that, there, as Peter said, there's one thing that is actually one way and one alley that we have to go down that is really very useful and, and, and can be you know, of, of high value for the humankind. But on the other hand, because we have to use these highly and, and sophisticated AI models, there's only always the risk of, of danger in whatever way to misuse these, these systems as well. So how do we deal with this? Um, the problem is that we, we cannot say we avoid it, you know, we cannot say that, that we don't touch it, we don't do it, because it will be done, it's already moving forward. Um, and one thing that I uh, has already been mentioned by the previous speaker is that if we look at who is able to actually do these kind of things today, you know, who, who can build these robots, who can build the systems that can drive the robots, the AI technology inside, it's only very few. Yeah, and it's not even states. It's not even countries. It's actually private companies. Yeah. So if you want to create the foundational models that you need in order to enable a robot to do these kind of tasks that I was describing, you have to put a lot of money into into creating the model, you know, and the foundational model. And if you look at who is doing this today, it's the big five, and not even countries, not even the high developed and rich countries in Europe or in North America are putting the kind of resources to the table. So this kind of in um, uh, this uh, idea of having the IDA, I think I, I do support a lot because it gives the opportunity 
to create um, ways uh, to design these systems that gives the power to more and more people. So instead of just having a few experts that can design these kind of systems, we have the possibility by creating standards in the way we design and program these systems from the very low level mechanical and electronic uh, level of, of performance all the way up to the high level behavior and decision making in these devices. So these standard, standards have to be created and somebody has to monitor them. Uh, monitor them. And that's something that can be done by, by you know, as, as we have seen it in, in software development tools uh, in general. If you go back to the 70s, for example, there were a few people on the planet that could program your IBM computer. And these guys were, you know, flown back and forth between all parts of the world, you know, in order to do this kind of programming. In the meantime, we have been able to develop frameworks and model-based development tools that allows basically everybody to program his own computer. And the same thing, I think we have to think about for, for, uh, for, for robotics and for artificial intelligence-based systems. The effect of this though, will be that we have more and more people that are able to not just create these systems, but also to understand their working and to understand their inner functionality. And that usually is a way, effective way to block and to, to put a wall to, um, to misuse of, of these kind of systems. The other thing that these um, you know, model-based frameworks for design and programming um, um, allows us to do is we can also um, use um, meta-knowledge, meta-knowledge for all the parts that go into these robots, you know, so we can have a cradle uh, uh, to grave tracking of all the components that go into these robots. Where has this motor been produced? Who has produced it? What material was used for it? What was the carbon footprint for exactly this material that went, went into your robot? So we can, we can track it, but all by, um, you know, having a more standardized way uh, to design, to build, and finally to program and use the kind of systems that by no means, by no, by, by no question, we need in the future to serve so many challenges that humankind is, is, is facing now and moreover in the future. So that will be my, my comment and my hope for, you know, something that um, an institution or an idea like the IDA could support and maybe even be an institution like Peter said to monitor this kind of development worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for adding this new aspect of uh, creating standard and also monitoring the compliance with this standard. And um, yeah, also this uh, tracking system that you mentioned for the, um, for the design development and use of robots and AI. We're going to go on now with um, our on-site participant, Yongo, on my left side. OK, thank you very much. I'm uh, the pronunciation for uh, um, European is very difficult. I'm sorry <laughs> for <laughs> that. <laughs> OK, thank you very much for having me um, at this good opportunity to this meaningful meeting, especially for uh, Professor Peter. Kirschlegan and um, um, Evelyn. So I have very uh, many things learned from this conference yesterday and today from uh, today also uh, from uh, present uh, presenter. Um, how should we live in prepare for our digitalized society in order to preserve or even more promote our human rights with digital technology? Uh, so let me start with the brief quote of um, a technique philosopher Heidegger. A quote began, regardless of whether we enthusiastically embrace technology or deny technology, we are bound to it helplessly. The question, um, uh, the question concerning technology, uh, so end. Yes, the using of AI is unstoppable current. Uh, for example, I should should um, um, our si situation in Korea uh, experience um, to to express. Um, uh, before three months, the uh, Korea uh, Ministry of Education decided to 
offer AI education to all our children and high school students starting in 2025. Uh, in addition, primary subjects such as math, English will be taught with AI tools. It means to two ways, uh, coding and uh, some um, related to AI technology. We should all, we should all uh, run in our, our our education knowledge we should do, and also in other subjects, mathematics uh, and English, English, with this subject, also uh, with AI tools to all uh, to be offered to uh, all our uh, educational person. Um, so in this context, I would like to say that it is very um, evidently, self-evidently, that we should have an agent such as Control Tower, IDAM. Because as we are well known, AI technology has not only positive, but also, as mentioned, a negative side. So that we need to uh, Control Tower in order to minimize the negative side. It's self, uh, it is uh, self-evidently. Therefore, more, I think, more significant is not mere asking whether it is possible, but asking a question in regarding how it should be, uh, should, will be. More concrete, how we should and will build the uh, institute. Because such a question finally constitutes an uh, object or targets of our question and the uh, thought underlying the question constitutes the character of that object, meaning to say question make entity. So with following two questions, I would like to suggest a uh, discussion in regarding of direction of building of item. First, it's about the problem of infinite regress. In the age of artificial intelligence, data are becoming ownerless. Well, even though yesterday many presenters in the main session have stressed the data authority, but this fact can be considered as a contrafactual evidence for the fact that the ownerhood of data is becoming weak. The agents that regulate the use of data will eventually collect more data than any other agency should be, should be controlled or regulated. This could lead to call for the agency to be a subject to be also controlled as well. Yeah. Therefore, it is important to well um, demonstrate the uh, agency's trustworthiness. At this moment, we should come back to the value of uh, transparency and fairness. The second. The problem is of, of uh, defini definitional research on human rights. Okay, if we discuss the concept of human rights in the abstract and theoretical dimensions, such as level of uh, political declaration, um, maybe <laughs> today so many speaker uh, yesterday in the main session said, it may be related to the just philosophical concepts such as uh, very broad concept human rights or human dignities. But, however, if we consider the cultural context in Africa or Asia and so many uh, other groups, the concept of human rights will be made concrete and realized in accordance with the situation. This should be a research group to establish a good circle or the Victoria circle uh, uh, structure between general and particular value, namely universality and diversity. I think this should ultim ultimately be implemented through um, collaborated research uh, between uh, very, um, uh, um, various uh, research group, uh, something a uh, law uh, researcher and ethics and philosophical uh, research group. Okay, uh, my point, word two. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much.
Young also for um, pointing out first the uh, role of education and knowledge, which we haven't talked about yet. And of course also for trans highlighting the need of transparency, fairness, and um, embedding human rights in their, in their contexts. So we will go on now with um, our online speaker, Migle. Migle, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly and we see you also. Okay, good. Uh, so first of all, uh, it's great to see you again, although even it's, it's online, but uh, it's great to see Evelyn, Peter, uh, Kutuma and Yongo. It's, it's great to see you again. Uh, my point, uh, thanks of course for, uh, for this opportunity to explain why do I think that AIDA is, is relevant and necessary in this, in, this, in, this, um, in this context of especially artificial intelligence advancements. So basically my point was more, uh, you know, I start from the European perspective so as to argue that, well, we need, we do not have, and therefore we need a, a sort of international agency to address, uh, address the threats uh, that the artificial intelligence and the related systems might give rise to. So much so that European Parliament has recently published its suggestions on how to expand how to improve the, the proposal for the Artificial Intelligence Act that the European Commission is promoting, right? That the, the, the first artificial intelligence uh, legislative uh, document that we are right now negotiating in, in, at the European level. And one of the things that the European Parliament has seen as very relevant and very, very important was the idea that we need to address the not only classify artificial intelligence on the basis of the risk, but also bear in mind that the high risk artificial intelligence systems uh, might and surely surely will have uh, a huge impact on the human rights. And therefore, the European Parliament has proposed to uh, propose that the high risk artificial intelligence systems should undergo the fundamental rights impact assessment, which was not foreseen in the in the original version of the of this legislative proposal so uh, the assessment of the of the of the of this impact would basically include such elements as the purpose of the system intended geographic and temporal scope of the of the use of the system categories of natural persons and groups not only persons as such but also groups likely to be affected by the use of the system how uh, how how we are going to verify that the, that the particular artificial intelligence system is compliant with the uh, with with the legislation related to the fundamental rights, but of course it applies to the human rights more widely. And what kind of reasonably foreseeable impact we can envisage through this impact assessment, and what specific risks, what harms can we think of, and what adverse impact there might there might be, and should this assessment lead to the um, uh, lead to the certain huge and negative uh, outcomes, so that the the foreseeable misuses or harms are are, are kind of uh, uh, especially relevant. Uh, the uh, the the developer needs to inform both the national and national authorities and also the stakeholders. Uh, and in particular, the national supervisory authority that might start the investigation. So having said this, of course, we say, okay, that's, that's a great initiative. And well, we very much hope that all these assessments might be brought into, into, into being. Um, what I do, where I do see the, the role of AIDA is that is making, is uh, basically, being the focal point where all these assessment, assessments might flow so as to uh, basically make the good use of all this enormous amount of information related to artificial intelligence risks and, uh, and harms to people and, and groups of individuals or ethnical uh, groups or, or, or any other groups of, of, of human beings. 
uh, because this information information is fundamental to prevent uh, to prevent these risks and negative impacts, right? So making this knowledge also available and accessible for international organizations uh, would help us also not only to uh, prevent these harms from taking place in Europe, but also would expand this protection worldwide because United Nations and in particular this, uh, the International Database Systems Agency, so IDA, could be the institution that could be in charge of this task because otherwise you know, we discover things in Europe, but then we export, then we would say, okay, so that many companies might say, okay, we cannot do this in Europe, but there is the rest of the world, right? Where you can do anything you want. And the, the way to prevent this from taking place is to uh, build IDA and make it the focal point for this sort of information to be distributed, accumulated, and put to the, to the use that would prevent any abuse, harm, or other negative effects on the on the other on the people from other continents where actually i think kutuma rightly pointed out that there is a tendency there was a historical tendency you know to uh to colonialize and abuse other continents so i think this is uh this is the way to prevent uh, also uh, the repetition of historical errors we're still kind of not comfortable with thank you very much Thank you very much, Migli, for your input. And um, also highlighting again, I think all the speakers have agreed that um, yeah, technology has lots of advantages, but we also need to handle the, um, the negative consequences and the risks, especially when it comes to these high risks AI that you mentioned, which um, at least at the European level then um, has these impact assessments and what to do with these with this assessments or with this information that these assessments generate. Like ideally to predict future risks. So there also we have um, um, like a new contribution that we have not discussed so far yet for AIDA. We will go on now to our last speaker who is online from Brazil. I'm not going to ask you what time zone that is and what hour of the day, but um, Yuri, if you are there, can you, can you hear us? Sure. Thank you, Evelyn. It's 4 a.m. in Rio, <laughs> so good afternoon to the participants of this important session on the International Database Systems Agency. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. I would like to briefly speak about the challenges of building a fairer international division of labor in the digital economy. In the past decade, we have witnessed the rapid and unprecedented evolution of AI and digital platforms that ushered in a new digital hyper-globalized economy. These powerful changes have transformed the essence of work globally and will continue to do so. While the potential to risk of recent technological advances to drive growth and innovation is staggering, there is a significant disconnect between the pace of this evolution and society's capacity to adapt. The speed at which new technologies emerge far surpasses our collective ability to understand, regulate, and fairly integrate them into our economic fabric. The result is an unequal distribution of the benefits of this technological progress. The digital economy as it stands presents a stark disparity between the international flow of profits and labor. While a handful of multinational tech giants amass incredible wealth, sometimes larger than countries' GDPs, most of the digital labor force finds itself in a challenging position. This dichotomy results in an international division of labor that is often invisible, underpaid, and inhumane a modern dynamic that echoes centuries-old practices when resources from many were channeled to benefit a privileged minority. The technologies might have changed, but the underlying logic in their development, operation, and even disposal still relies on exploring cheap labor from the global south. From Kenyan content moderators who flag harmful content to train chat GTP, and gig workers in Brazil who drive for Uber 
while producing data that helps to develop autonomous cars that will eventually replace them. To the Congo miners who extract the materials to produce the next iPhone that will later be dumped in electronic waste landfills in Thailand. Many people around the world face poor working conditions with low pay and little to no labor rights or protections to sustain a digital economy that seems very clean and sleeky in the developed economies Silicon Valley. Meanwhile, Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights articulates everyone's rights to just and favorable conditions of work and to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring an existence worthy of human dignity. Moreover, the Sustainable Development Goal number eight calls for a decent work for all, fostering economic growth while upholding workers' dignity, safety, and rights. Sadly, the current digital economy diverges from these noble ideals. In consequence, the time has come for urgent action to promote a more ethical international division of labor in the digital economy. We need greater transparency around the supply chains in labor practices that sustain big tech. We must recognize that the role of underdeveloped countries in the global flow of technology and wealth cannot be diminished in importance as it is imbricated with the more valued parts of this global value chain, both sustaining and allowing it to exist in the first place. The global South, where much of this digital sweatshop labor takes place, must have a seat at the table in determining global rules for the digital economy. Enter the potential role of an international database systems agency, IDA, an agency that can serve as a sentinel, monitoring and ensuring that the principles of fairness, justice, and equality are upheld in the digital sphere. Observing the current state, but also anticipating future challenges, IDA can shine a light on areas that have remained in the shadows, revealing inequities identifying best practices and recommending actionable solutions. An IDA at the UN level can bring transparency and provide a platform for governments, workers, businesses, and civil society to engage, collaborate, and commit to a fairer digital economy. By promoting the rights to a fair international division of labor, IDA would ensure that a larger portion, portion of the society, not just a privileged few, enjoy the fruits of the digital revolution. In conclusion, while technology drives progress, it is our collective responsibility to ensure that this progress does not come at the cost of human rights and sustainability. As we build a more technologically advanced society, we cannot leave human rights and dignity behind. The future we want is one of inclusive prosperity and equity. Getting there, we require both steps to reform the international division of labor in the digital economy as it stands. An international database assistance agency at the UN can be a platform for technical cooperation in the field of digital transformation, promoting a just and equitable digital future for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri, for... Um also pointing out here what Kutuma already um, mentioned as well, like who is sitting at the table and that absolutely the Global South also needs to be included um, as well if we talk about labor rights, but of course not exclusively. Thank you for that. Um, we have now um, heard the inputs of all our speakers, so I would like to, to give the word to the audience, both on site and online, first for a round of, um, of questions and answers to our panelists. Maybe we can start first with the participants here on site, if you have any open questions. Yes. Hi. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Suji, and I'm from Seoul, Korea. <laughs> and I'm studying public administration in the 
Seoul National University, and now I am a PhD student. So I, I really, really wanted to ask, is there any um, model as a governance? So, I mean, is, the, are, is IDA is looking for uh, IAEA model or FDA model kind of things? So if you are thinking that AI could be a hazard as a nuclear energy, then are you thinking about IAEA model? And then do, do you think it is fit for the context of AI and, and what, what should be the authority and power for the governance exactly? And so I was curious about what the governance body of IDA would actually do concretely and what the authority or power should it have? Thank you. Thank you so much for posing this very important question, like about the concrete uh, function and powers also. Who would like to answer that question from the panelists, maybe? Peter? Well, thank you so much especially for the, the question. Um, so you're absolutely right that there need to be adoptions made, you know, to, let's say, the, the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency adopting it to the field of AI. I think you're absolutely right on that. I still would think that the model of the International Atomic Energy Agency can serve um, to give us orientation how you know how, how many functions, um, rights, entitlements such an agency should have in order to really make a difference then on the ground. Because I think what's important now is that we have I think we have gone through a period of beautiful declarations and guidelines and recommendations, but we haven't seen yet so much impact of that. You know, businesses run as usual. Um, we're still facing the same risks. Um, you know, we are not that good in identifying the ethical opportunities together. Not everyone is benefiting from AI, and so um, we need something really which is um, teethful, so has has an impact. And I think there, um, we need to adopt the International Atomic Energy Agency model in order to make it fit for AI. But I think it's possible. Um, looking at, for example, um, concrete functions um, either should have, for example, what is absolutely usual and not even questioned in the field of the pharmaceutical industry is a certain kind of approval of access to market process. Um, and something similar would be needed to, to be done in the field of AI, so either would have the rights to run such approval process. Secondly, it would need to have, I mean, the proposal would be that it has also possibility to sanction um, not only state but also non-state actors not fulfilling their duties, not fulfilling their obligations. Um, so in order really to make, um, to see a difference, um, you know, of the impact of, of uh, artificial intelligence um, on, on the ground. Basically, you know, the underlying motive is to protecting the weak from the powerful. Um, so and and of course, who the powerful is, as we have heard from from Frank Kirchner from um, from Germany, is that you know the the powerful it has kind of shifted. You know, the powerful in the field of AI are the multinational tech giants, um, and not so much the states anymore. So of course, that needs to take into consideration as well. Thank you. Would you also like to add something? Yeah, just, uh, yeah. just quickly. Um, and I think uh, for me, this also relates to uh, Migle's uh, uh, contribution when she talked about uh, the uh, uh, EU AI Act, which is currently being uh, uh, debated. So I it's, um, it's interesting because it is an EU AI Act. Uh, and my take is that it's, it's kind of going to be slightly different from, say, the U.S., if they're going to be talking about uh, their own act. And it would be different from, say, for example, Brazil, or for, uh, perhaps uh, also Africa might be looking at uh, you know, a different kind of act or regulations. And within these particular countries or, or continents, there will be also countries looking at different uh, regulatory policies or, or acts, if you like, uh, whatever it is that they are looking at in terms of uh, AI policy. And so uh, for me, I think that uh, IDA would be, one of the things that IDA could do is to then sieve through all these different uh, regulatory policies to help come up with, uh, I know it's going to be quite difficult, but at least come up with uh, something akin to one global standard 
of uh, artificial intelligence because uh, as uh, Peter rightly said, uh, one of the things that Ida will do is to uh, potentially do is to uh, protect the weak from the strong. So if we have an organization or an agency like Ida, I think it might help to then come up with some standard or some uh, AI uh, act that can be cohesive and cover uh, a, a global ground so that everyone is protected in that, uh, in that respect. Thank you very much for these excellent Hello? No. Yes? Okay. Thank you uh, um, for sharing your, your insights on that. And um, are there any more questions here from the on-site participants? If not, we would go on to see if there are online uh, questions. But please, if you have any, any more questions, feel free to, to pose them. If not, Melina, she's our online moderator. Um, may I ask, are there any questions in the online chat? Uh, good afternoon. Yes, actually, there's one question by Ayalev Shebeji. So I would like to invite you to ask your question. And now he um, uh, didn't raise the hand, but he already um, posed the question in the chat. I, I will read it. And is it possible to protect or prevent international database information by building sophisticated technology advancement? Or is there any other means to protect or prevent from the hackers? Who would like to answer uh, that? Uh, the... uh, okay. uh, sorry. Um, yes. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I can elaborate uh, uh, my question. Uh, it looks like a little bit clattering words. Uh, if sorry, you maybe if you could put on your camera, is that possible? So we can also see you. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank you Here so much. I, I joined um, uh, uh, IGF in Addis Ababa last year, and I'm researching in uh, uh, digital fiat currency and um, or CDBC um, in Australia. I just finished my master in information and communication technology. Uh, my uh, understanding uh, is last year. Uh, there is a positive and negative impact of um, AI. And also uh, we haven't mentioned here is a lot of technologies behind it. Um, uh, uh, we have uh, AOT and IOT and also uh, uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, all these data, has, um, all these technologies is generating huge amount of data um, we are trying to create, uh, as I can see now, is international database. So are we really uh, creating um, international database and protecting this database with a sophisticated technology? Or is there any other mechanism we can uh, regulate internationally with the global south, including global south? At the current uh, um, database, for example, um, SWIFT code or SWIFT uh, is internationally uh, a data transaction uh, 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 with a, a cross border, and that's uh, uh, 835 different banks of different nations is signed and regulated. Uh, we need to find that kind of uh, uh, international rules and regulation also. Uh, we need to uh, um, think how we teach the hackers. Uh, if we hack another country, uh, what happens if another person or another uh, hackers hacking our own country? We need to have um, ethics. So uh, what are actually the, uh, these um, international um, IGF forum uh, try to find out and set up um, all inclusive uh, countries, uh, international law, which is governing both internet and internet related technologies. And what are the, what are the perspectives? This is my question. So thank you very much. If it's not clear, I can uh, elaborate more. Thank you very much for your question. If I understood correctly, your question has to do with 
the um, regulation of this huge amount of data and how the Global South can be included specifically. Please correct me if something is missing. Okay, so uh, who wants to address this question from the panelists, both on-site or online? Kutuma, please go ahead, yes. Um, well, I, I don't know if I'm going to address it uh, adequately, but uh, yeah, I'll address it uh, in a manner that I can perhaps understood it. Um, I think your question for me took me to, uh, re uh, to reflect on uh, discussions that we're having around ChatGPT. I mean, it hasn't been um, very long. Uh, I mean, a couple of uh, years, if, if you like, we didn't really have uh, a concern around ChatGPT. So now, you know, we're starting to uh, look at it and think about all these uh, uh, concerns in education and, uh, you know, in different kinds of, of uh, sectors. And uh, ChatGPT is a classic example of how uh, these unintended consequences can actually affect um, uh, different, um, I suppose, organizations or corners of the world uh, differently. And, and it's a one technology that has, is permeating everywhere. And people are struggling to understand how or what policies, uh, you know, we can start uh, looking at, uh, I mean, coming from uh, being an academic and uh, you know being very much involved in uh, uh, student uh, uh, activities and uh, student uh, modules and things like that, uh, we are now thinking about oh okay, uh, this is a, a technology that has bolted, so there is no way of uh, you know bringing it back. So how do we uh, uh, help students or how do we encourage students to use it responsibly? And I think this is something that everyone is kind of uh, thinking about uh, across. Uh, 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 across the globe, and there is no uh, uh, there is no right way of, of of looking at it, and this is why we probably need agents like uh, Ida to proactively look at these particular global events or situations, and how we can then have a, a global um, mitigating. Um, uh, uh, aspects related to this. So, uh, and one of the things that we ought to be doing also is to be inclusive. And I think you did uh, uh, allude to to the fact that uh, you know, y in the global south, you know, there could be an impact and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, only a few, uh, uh, I suppose, especially from developed, more developed countries, really are sitting at the table discussing these particular elements. And we need an agency like IDA to ensure that um, everyone, including people from the Global South, from the Global North, are sitting at the table trying to find solutions to uh, con uh, concerns that are currently emerging or to have, uh, uh, to look to have a foresight in terms of what could potentially come as a result of these particular technologies uh, uh, coming in. We shouldn't just sit around and wait until something has happened in order for us to then start scrambling to find uh, solutions. And this is one example of what uh, uh, ChatGPT has done, and I'm sure a lot of our other upcoming technologies are doing. So I hope I've answered uh, your question, perhaps even in a little way. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of course, Peter, please. May I just, um, well, thank you so much for your question. I want to wanna add like three minor points. Um, I think the first thing is really that IDA should promote technological cooperation. And I think that's um, very important for for tackling, you know, cybersecurity. And, and secondly, you chose also that IDA needs to have some kind of force also being legally binding because the problem like cybersecurity we cannot tackle with recommendations and, and guidelines. And thirdly, I think it, it creates a certain kind of optimism that this will be, be possible to find a you know, global consensus on IDA because of the econ huge and enormous um, damage, economic damage. Um, cybersecurity is basically you know, threatening all of us, be it you know, state actors, be it non-state actors, and to join forces in that regard you know, um, could help us to tackle that huge issue. 
um, and and I would suggest that you know Ida could play a su substantial role in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Are there any further questions from the audience um, online? Melina, is there anybody there who want to ask another question? Uh, no, I don't see any more questions. Does anyone want to add something? Well, if, if there's no other questions, I would like to add to what Peter just said to um, <clears throat> the question of um, uh, Yalev. Um, I think Peter already said we, we cannot prevent hackers from doing what they want to do. You know, it's criminal. So we will always have criminals in the world. And if they have enough criminal energy, they will do it. So this is not the way we can um, make the, this data safe. Um, but there is, uh, of course, other ways to do it, and that's what, what my comment was about the standardization and the opening of this knowledge to a broader audience, to a broader public, you know, and this is exactly where, where the um, agency could, could be a, a vital role, could play a vital role, because if you think about Wikipedia, you know, if you think something like that, this is an open uh, a database, you know, a database of knowledge, and everybody can read it and everybody can add to it. And this is how I think you, you would be able to um, minimize the possibilities of misuse or hacking or whatever uh, by, the, by the largest extent, because if everybody has the, sees and has the benefit from having this database, everybody will also make sure that this database is not corrupted. So still means that there's possibilities for you know, people that want to misuse it, they will misuse it. And then we have, like has already been said, ways actually of, of, of regulatory or, or laws, you know, that can then intervene and say, okay, you misuse this data, you will be, you know, punished with by law, you know, because you 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 committed a crime, whatever, yeah? because you misused the the data that we provided uh, to the uh, general public all over the planet. But uh, to my mind, the the, the biggest uh, or the the best possibility to to make sure that we can use this great technology, which is it, which it is, right? It is a great, a very, very powerful technology. We have to use it, but we have to use it to our best, to our benefit. And we have to live with the fact that there will always be people uh, that try at least to, to misuse it. And this is where governance, uh, where governments can come in and set in, you know, regulations like the EU says, you will not be um, 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 punished for, for creating artificial intelligence. You will be punished for misusing it. You know, if you come up with an application that is misusing uh, artificial intelligence. So that, that's my perspective. And I think it's it's correct what you said, you know, by looking at the the further demands on automation that I have referred to, all these machines, all these robots, all these machines, you mentioned the Internet of Things, they will all create data. And it is uh, an enormous uh, challenge and, and yeah, task for, for humankind, actually, uh, how to manage and how to create and how to safeguard this data. But it cannot be just in the hand of a few big companies. You know, we, we, we should not forget that. Uh, Peter also mentioned it. It's not the States, it's not United States, it's not Germany, it's not the European Union that is creating these techniques. It's companies. <laughs> it's companies that have enough money, you know, to pay the energy bill of, of a state like New York, you know, to create a, f a foundational model. Billions of dollars. Nobody can, can put these billions of dollars out. And, and the most stupid thing is that they are all doing it again and again and again. So if, you know, Microsoft comes I'm up sorry with creating... to interrupt you, Frank, but I got the sign here from the, um, the, from the technical okay. stuff that we have to come to a close of this session. But uh, I would like again to take the opportunity to thank all participants, all speakers, both on and offline. I think um, there was a broad consensus that we need to if possible, proactively prevent the misuse and risks of um, so-called artificial intelligence database systems. And standard setting, of course, as also Frank has pointed out now at the end, um, is, is a way to do it, is also a way to do it for IDA. 
And um, yes, thank you very much again for being here. And I'm sure that discussion is going to continue. Who knows? Maybe at next year's IGF. Let's see. So thank you again for, for being here. Thank you.